what is more important, dollar amount or number of deals? And we're going to flash just so you know some of your uh, some of your achievements in the space. I, both, both factors are important. I think when people look at the M&A market, they're looking for dollar amounts as a barometer of how robust the market is, what they see on the front page of the newspaper. But when you think about the overall health of the market and a robust barometer of the health of the market, number of deals is important because that tells you the breadth of the M&A activity rather than just focusing on this narrow slice at the top of the market, which generates the high dollar values. Yes. And that number has actually come down quite a lot in the quarter. We saw this, this strange uh, dis dislocation where we had a terrible December credit market pullback. Obviously, then we roared into 2019 with the Bristol-Myers deal, very, very big. But actually, the, the, the count of deals has fallen. So what does that tell us about where we are now in the M&A cycle? Right. No, it, it's true. I, I think what we saw was about a 30% drop in the number of deals, even though the dollar number remained fairly flat. I think it tells you that there's a number of factors that are depressing the M&A activity. It's hard to pinpoint a single one of them, but I think you mentioned the, the debt market dislocation. I think there are some residual impacts of that, certainly offset by the Fed's indication that it wasn't going to be raising interest rates again this year, but that's, there's certainly some jitteriness in the debt market resulting from that. I think you also have concerns about valuations, which I think is, relates also to the questions about continued global growth. I think a lot of the buyers are looking at stock prices and deal values and saying those, aren't, those are outpacing the fundamentals of the businesses they're looking at. Uh, the, the buyers, but also a lot of the buyer shareholders, because this has been an increasing trend. We've seen the, the, on the acquirer side, we've seen the shareholders A, react negatively day one to deals a lot more than they have done through the cycle, but also becoming a lot more vocal in their criticism of deals. We saw that in the, uh, in the Newmont deal with Goldcorp. We also saw it in the Bristol Myers Selgin deal more recently. I know you're involved in that deal, so there's not an amount you can say, but how much of an issue has that become for acquirers in actually going forward with big deals? Right. And I, I think one other driver of that trend is the fact that stock has become an increasingly important component of a lot of the big deals that we're seeing. And when shareholders see stock being issued in the deal, they start to worry about things like dilution and whether they're issuing undervalued stock if they perceive their stock to be undervalued. So what you're starting to see is boards having to spend time ahead of buy side M&A thinking about what that shareholder reaction might be. That they have to think about, I've done a lot of shareholder engagement. That's been the popular thing that everyone's been saying to do over the last three years. You actually have to digest that and think about what have your shareholders been telling you? How are your shareholders going to react to this deal? Are there vulnerabilities in my deal terms or my deal structure that shareholders are going to pounce on if they oppose the deal? And when you issue more than 20% of stock, you need a shareholder vote. And that's really an opening where an activist or a shareholder that opposes the deal can jump in and make some noise. You go ahead, Vonnie. Well, I was just going to say, and, and plus the regulatory regime has changed a little bit as well. How yeah. have your thoughts on vertical versus horizontal deals yeah. evolved over the last right. couple of years? Right. I, I think on the regulatory side, there have been a bunch of new regimes that have come in place. You have the CFIUS pilot program. Actually, the European national security regime is coming online tomorrow, actually. so we're, But we haven't really seen that play out necessarily that substantively. I think the key on the regulatory side that we've been focused on is unexpected expected outcomes. I think a lot of the times we're seeing substantive outcomes and timelines going in unexpected directions. You had AT&T Time Warner that you referred to challenging a vertical merger. I don't think anyone thought at the outset that they were going to go through two trials in order to get that deal done. You had NXP Qualcomm where you had the Chinese regulator blocking the deal. And just the other day you had CFIUS stepping in and forcing the divestiture of the Grindr dating app long after the deal closed. So I think what you're really seeing is people having a hard time guessing at what the timeline's going to be or what the outcome might be, and that's causing uncertainty in the deal market. I, I want to pick up on a bit of that, which is this geopolitical side of it. We, you mentioned that the China blocking the NXP deal, and then obviously we've seen CFIUS as well. Uh, are other countries beginning to play on this front as well? I mean, Russia, for instance, obviously some deals are going through there. Are we seeing more countries become more aggressive in terms of protecting national interests? I, I think both national interest and using some regulatory regimes for political goals is certainly something we're focused on. I don't think it's yet become a significant obstacle to deal activity, but you're having to think about it. When you sit down and talk to a management team or a board about doing a deal, you have to think about, is there a country here that's on the table that might look at this deal and say, here's an opportunity for me to advance my own national interest. Here's an opportunity for me to disrupt something that's important to another country. And I, I do think we're spending some time figuring out how do you allocate the risk of that? Because 
Typically, when you have a known risk, it's easy to allocate that between the buyer and seller. When you have a universe of unknown risks, it's much harder to identify, negotiate, and discuss those risks. All right, so for U.S. buyers, other than China, obviously, where are they most worried about in terms of that risk? I think, I think places like Russia, where there's a lot of uncertainty and where the political winds blow in different directions every day, I, I think that's another area where we have some concerns about what might they be looking at in a deal. And then I think there's also more aggressive enforcement in some jurisdictions where you wouldn't have expected it in the past. Speaking of geography, we're seeing a lot more activism by U.S. activists in Europe and the U.K. as well, and banks and all sorts of areas where we wouldn't have before. How is that changing the landscape for M&A? Right. I, I think we are focusing on that as U.S. activists take activist tactics that they've developed in the U.S. markets and take them across to Europe. So it's becoming just like it's developed into a much bigger theme here in the U.S. with activists catalyzing M&A, opposing M&A. That same dynamic has replicated itself in Europe. Truthfully, the, the regimes in Europe are actually more friendly to the companies in terms of defending against activists. And also, there is a little bit of a more nationalistic mentality in some of the countries in Europe, which help you as a company defend against those activists. And there's, while activists have definitely had some success in Europe, particularly on the M&A side, the companies have been fairly successful in either getting their deals through or preventing the activists from forcing M&A activity, like you had with, uh, with Axo Noble and Elliott in, in, in the Netherlands. Another change we've seen here in activism um, and I obviously say this at risk of, of doing down my own industry a bit, but the, the activists seem to have become extremely savvy in using the media. They always were, but now they don't necessarily need to file a 13D. They don't even necessarily need a big position. They can just get something into the press and sort of use us as a sledgehammer. H how much of an issue is that for the companies and how much of these fights is no longer substantive but is more optics? Yeah, I, maybe not optics, but I certainly think that the PR fight has become central to the discussion because... Well, because you have to convince ISS and, and the shareholder yeah. advisories, right? Absolutely, it's ISS, but I think even before you get to the ISS stage of the process, very early on, you have to focus on getting your message across to the shareholders, whether it's when you announce the deal, when an activist first surfaces, it's critical that you are in front of the press and using the press and using the media as effectively as the activists, and it's exciting, so people like it.